usually work in downtown and all over the place, but I'm a resident of Palmdale. So um, I love this town. I come here often. Um, and I'm happy that I can share my afternoon with you guys. And thank you for filling the room today. Um, I think we had about maybe a month's notice to get this out, so we're glad the word got out that this was actually happening. Um, it's a very important conversation. You all know why you're here, so I don't need to remind you why you're here. Um, but we will go through this process. The agenda is, um, it'll be a little bit organic. We do want to start, obviously, with an overview of the permitting process. We've had some very good discussions with the town council. Um, pretty robust discussions that have led to some special conditions and other things that Gary Smith will introduce in a second. Um, we'll talk to you about. Um, but we obviously want to open this up to the wider community as well and extend the conversation out so everyone has a chance to weigh in as well. Um, just a few quick introductions, um, and I will not get everyone, so my apologies. Um, to my right, your left, is Chuck Boswick. Chuck is the field deputy from our Animal Valley office, Mr. Supervisor Parker. Julia Rosco from our executive office. Um, Paul Ugly from Film LA. Gary Smith, the executive officer of the county, our film liaison. Oscar Gomez, regional planning. Um, Sam Chin from Public Works. And in the back, we have our law enforcement folks, our partners of CHP and sheriffs. Um, we have um, Officer Raymond. <laughs> we have from Sheriff's Department, Sergeant Bose, Sergeant Martinez. And we also have Deputy Martinez in the back as well. Um, thank you all for being here. And I see we have fire appears to have shown up in the back as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Um, I also want to recognize we do have a couple of town council members in the audience. Jackie Ayers here. Um, Kelly Tano's here as well. So thank you for being here. Um, am I missing anyone? Um, my apologies if I have. For the rest of you, again, thank you for coming. As I mentioned, we've been working very closely with the town council and several other community, uh, community members that are concerned or pleased in some cases about what's going on with filming and acting. You're all well aware of the beauty and appeal of this area and why this would be a good location um, for you know folks to want to come and film. There's a lot of diversity in the geography in place, uh, beautiful scenery, open spaces, so on and so forth. So it's not a mystery why the industry wants to come here. Um, our interest has been, Mr. Supervisor Gardner, obviously to try to weigh that balance. The county obviously has an interest in continuing to attract um, industry folks to keep them in Southern California. We would love, we would love to keep you know, the film industry, digital uh, film media in Southern California, and Los Angeles County in particular, thank you. Um, but we also have to strike the balance, and that balance is what we've been working on uh, with the town council at this point, and we wanted to share some of that with you know, the wider community as well. Um, again, it is our interest to make sure that balance exists. Um, it's great to support industry. We have to make sure that the citizens that live in these communities um, are not having to live with you know, severe quality of life issues. So that is the water we've been trying to navigate, and you'll hear some of that and how that has been playing out today, what some of the solutions have been. And obviously, we're going to be interested in hearing from a lot of you on what your ideas are. Um, there are comment cards in the back on the table. They're basically just three by five index cards. Please feel free to fill them out. You can just drop them at the front here, or Chuck might circulate around and grab them from you. And as we go along, um, more towards the end of the presentation, we'll have a listening session where it'll be an opportunity to answer the questions on those cards. Um, we're going to start with a film permitting operations overview. And again, for some of you, this is going to be kind of old hat. <laughs> I mean, town council has been through this extensively. They know what's going on. But maybe some of you aren't as familiar with what the county's process is or what the process is in general uh, to get and obtain a film permit and actually move into the community and do the work. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the microphone down to Gary Smith or Paul, whoever wants to go first. Um, so yeah, just quickly to introduce Paul. Um, <coughs> pardon me, just end up a cold. Uh, so Gary Smith, I'm the county's film and digital media liaison. So I work on probably problem solved through all the policies around film permitting, um, as well as work on some larger other policy issues uh, that support departments. 
So FMLA is a county's uh, contractor. They basically pull together all of the pieces that go into the county then approving a permit. So I want to be clear, I think in the past, and talking to some of the folks on the Act Town Council Film Committee as well, so we are, the, the county is the film permitting authority, right? So we approve the, the final permit, but there's a lot that goes into pulling together a permit, which we all talk about. Um, and so we have our permitting authority, which is part of the Public Works Department, who ultimately verifies all the steps along the process. But I just wanted to be clear that the film LA is a county contractor that is age to the county when it comes to sort of the whole process of film permitting. So I want to introduce Paul Audley. Um, he will take us through sort of the flow of how permitting works. Thanks, and I do want to give a little bit of background about um, the organization and why it exists. It actually was created uh, 23 years ago now by the city and county of Los Angeles when they merged their film offices into a not-for-profit organization, which today is called Film LA. And now we represent about 18 cities, 11 school districts, and the Angeles National Forest uh, for film permitting coordination. I do want to reemphasize that our job is to put applications through a process and in the end, in every one of the jurisdictions we serve, we are not the permit authority that makes the decision and allows that permit to be released to you. Uh, and so our job is to try to help make sure we have the right information, that that information gets out to the uh, permit authority as well as the community, and to try to balance those things. Uh, and part of the reason why this organization was created and part of what we do is because we're talking about the third largest industry in LA County, of the entertainment industry. Probably within you know every 10 people, there's someone who's either working in the industry or is directly related to the industry by providing supplies and other things to it. And so it is an important economic factor, uh, but that doesn't mean it's an overwhelming factor. We talk about and train our people on what's called the tripod that we serve at Film LA. The tripod includes the county in this case, it includes the film industry, and the third leg is the community where filming is going to happen. And we recognize that if you shorten any leg of a tripod, everything's going to fall over. And that balance is not always easy to attain, and certainly every human being on any one of those legs has different opinions about what is fair and what works. And so we try to balance that, take the input, and we have a pretty robust system uh, of recording that information. Right now, one of our difficulties is all that information about specific film sites is, a, <coughs> is at an address. Uh, we're now taking that into a geographic information system so that when something's happening in the area around, we're able to coordinate information about all those different addresses to get better information about what's going on in a community or a neighborhood. So we're dealing with uh, an industry that is on short timetables, but that doesn't mean we don't have enough time to process and to notify. So in Acton, for example, and in virtually every one of our jurisdictions, the minimum time to supply a permit to us is three full business days before the activities to take place. That gives us the opportunity to put out an initial notice to the community about what's coming. Uh, one of the things that will come up, and so I'll address it now, is sometimes the notices are not what ends up happening at the back end. But the notice, what is given to you as a notice, can't get more extensive. It may and often is reduced from the original notice, but the locations community and the film industry will give us what they think and what they would like to do, uh, and that's what we put out on that initial notice. The notice is given at least two business days in advance so that we can find out are there specific issues we need to deal with. Are there problems that uh, we may not know about in your neighborhood? It gets down to the point that um, in some of the neighborhoods we serve, someone may call and say, well, actually, there's a, an ambulatory care van that comes to pick up my mom on Wednesdays, and we need a space in front of the house. And we tell the film industry, put on their permit, they have to make available a space in front of that house on Wednesday for the AMBU van to come in. And so we get to that gritty level uh, when we're aware of problems. And so the thing I want to encourage is that if you get a notice and you see there's a problem, you need to tell us so we can help address it. Uh, the other part of it is you do have the ability here in Acton, and not in all places we serve, to register for email notice. Um, I think if you are on the Acton Town Council's email list, you've got to notice that you could do that. You can do it through our website at filmla.com, and that allows you to get the notices electronically because 
we have a problem in a lot of areas with uh, the fact that we do physical paper notices and how to attach those or how to keep them from blowing away in the wind or how to do it in a way that doesn't violate postal regulations and all those other things uh, become very complex and even more so in a community like Acton where you do have a lot more wind than most of the rest of the region we serve and we do have issues uh, with finding the right access points for you. So we encourage that to happen, that you use it. And in addition here, unlike many of the other places we serve, we also post those in community resource centers, like the library and some of the markets and other places that have billboards. So you've probably seen our very long blue notices. Uh, those are your opportunity to let us know what's going on. So the first thing that always happens is the film industry will fill out an application online and send it to Film LA for an initial review. We then look at something uh, called special conditions, which the industry can also see, and so can you, by going to filmla.com, and there's a thing that says for filmmakers, and under its area requirements, you can see the act in special conditions. And so we look at those to see if there's anything being requested that needs special attention against those special conditions that exist for Acton. And that includes things here that wouldn't happen so much in Hancock Park or downtown LA or Monrovia, including livestock evaluations if you're talking about loud noise uh, and those kinds of activities that we have become more and more aware of as you help to share with us some of the issues that are faced when uh, we're dealing in a more rural type environment where there are ranches and livestock. Uh, and so we may get an initial request and we have additional outreach and so does the film industry to those folks who've registered that they have livestock or that we're aware of and have now put into our mapping uh, for that region. That's the initial review. If they seem to meet those criteria or we've told them what they have to do to meet those criteria, then we go through a process of sending that application electronically to each of the departments of the county that has to approve the application. They may tell us to revise it. They may tell us it's fine to go. They may ask us to include additional conditions on the permit when it's finally released. Uh, and so all that activity happens in partnership with the county and our processes. When it's all done, um, we're also taking into consideration anything that's coming back from notices that have gone out of issues that are there. And so we're consulting constantly. And in the end, a permit is approved at Public Works, which is the permit authority for LA County. And we are instructed that we can then release that to the film industry to go ahead and do their work. That's not the end of our work, however, uh, with you as a community or with the county. We are available 24-7. Um, I hope that if you didn't, you will take this brochure with you when you leave, which tells you some of your rights and how things work in the community. It also includes our 24-7 number. Uh, and so we can be responsive to any issues that come up 24 hours a day, every day of the year, no holidays excluded. Uh, and we can respond to issues as they arise. Uh, we don't have authority and we don't want the authority to revoke or make arrests or any of those other things. We're a coordinating body, but we have great relationships with the different organizations and an ability to reach them when we need to if something's going on. Uh, the thing that I want to emphasize in all of this is there are cases um, where they are requested or required to have a film LA monitor. A film LA monitor is one of my staff people. They're uniformed. They wear khaki and a light blue shirt with a logo on it from Film LA. They'll be on the site and they have two functions. One, making sure the permit is followed. And two, relating to and trying to solve problems that may come up during the day uh, where they're approached by the community or we get a call from the community. They do not have enforcement powers. They have the ability to try to gain compliance or to try and solve a problem but they do not have enforcement powers. And we need to make that clear because sometimes a complaint comes back that they ask the uh, monitor to stop filming. They can't do that. It's not within their authority. Their job is to try to make sure things work right out there. And we have resources if it gets past that to go further. The last piece of this uh, puzzle really for us is when things are not in standard. So throughout the region, not just LA County, Standard filming time outside of commercial districts is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's part of the state's model film ordinance. It is part of virtually every other process and procedure followed. If somebody wants to film in these zones outside of that area, a survey is required. How many of you have ever been surveyed by the film industry? Or done the survey? 
Um, so what happens is they're coming and they're saying we're doing something out of the ordinary, and that may include things like special lighting or special uh, effects and other things happening. And they're asking you to let them know if there are issues and how you uh, feel approved, don't approve, if you have things that concerns that need to be addressed. These are not percentage surveys. It's not if 51% of the people say no, the county's going to say no. It's to instruct and to guide and to help us to determine and to provide advice and counsel for the county in the end to decide whether to amend the permit, release the permit, or what needs to be done. We record um, things on our system by address currently, as I mentioned, things like frequency complaints, problems in the past, uh, bad acts, good acts, uh, so that we have that information available. The survey process has to take place in enough time for us to advise the county about the results of those surveys and to try to adjust where we need to in that process. This is not something that uh, was created sort of whole cloth. These are policies and procedures that were inherited, that have been revised, that are now actually exactly in part of the process recommended by the state's model film ordinance. And in many cases, in many parts of our jurisdiction, where we have very different kinds of neighborhoods and or more frequency, those areas have special conditions. And if you go on our website, you'll see there are a lot of jurisdictions that have special conditions because they are unusual or get more filming than others. Uh, as I mentioned, we're 24-7 for you. Uh, and we have community liaisons assigned specifically to your community. So Arturo Pena uh, in my office is one of four community relations liaisons. Their job is, is to be there to, to help you. They're also there to be proactive, to work ongoing with the community and the filmmaking community in your neighborhood. And um, Pauline East, who covers a lot of the area for us and lives up here, uh, is sort of our on-the-ground person who can run around for us and, and be more present uh, and actually be physically here for you. Um, our job, as I said, is to do a balance, and that is not always uh, an easy thing to do, nor is it always something that everybody agrees the balance comes out fair in the end. Uh, but Acton, because of its special nature, because of things like agriculture, because of things like um, canyons and other things that conduct noise better, you have among the most restrictive, I would say, the top ten restrictive special conditions for any place we serve in greater Los Angeles. And so we want to hear from you. We always do. We try to respond. Uh, the special conditions are created through feedback from the community, through advice and counsel from Film LA, through the supervisor's offices and the staff to come up with what those look like to create that balance. Uh, we're very pleased and proud to serve the county now for uh, all that period of time. And our commitment remains to hear and try to do that balancing act, which again, I said, is not always going to be everybody 100% behind the end balance. It is creating that compromise. Thank you. Um, I just, just wanted to add a couple of process steps. I think it's inter interesting as well in terms of how the county permitting process works. So as Paul said, production wants to get a permit. They go to filmalay.com. They say they put on an application. They fill out the application, which is a you know, fillable form. And so as that gets processed internally within FilmLA, then it gets assigned to a specific film coordinator. And Josh Mingo is here today, who oversees our film herding section, and his team will be, uh, you know, one of the many, I don't know how many coordinators you have, I think, oh, well, over 10, right? Big team. So they will kind of go through who's going to handle which permit, right? And then they'll talk to the production. They'll hear about what the activities are that they want to do. So like they say, they want to blow a bus up at 2 o'clock in the morning and act it. Hello, that's a red flag. Um, you know, I'm going to probably get involved in that. That's not something we're going to encourage, um, given the nature of this environment. Um, but just to know that they really do talk with the production. They talk through the production around what is he want to do, you know, what, what is the activity, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they go through the special conditions and they break them all down with that production. So the production knows right off the bat, here's what you're getting into, here's what you can and cannot do. Um, so things go forward then, if, if everything's in line, um, then they'll go into the county system, film, uh, fire department reviews every single county permit that comes through, regardless. It's an automatic full stop review. So fire does that. And then if it's a zoning issue or there's a question where, uh, you know, there's a, they want to film in a significant ecological area, which will never happen, but sometimes if it's already disturbed, it does happen and we're kind of dealing with disturbed and undisturbed stuff. But this is Oscar Gomez and Oscar is 
this is one of his areas here, and he's from a DRP. His team will also review that particular activity, and you know, of course, if it is in an SEA, that's a pretty much a no. Um, but you know, if there's a temporary set being built, or there's anything that's happening that you know, I was outside the county code. This is what the DRP's responsibility is to catch that uh, and correct it. If roads are involved, any kind of intermittent road closures are involved, and Sam's team, uh, it will go to his department. This is all done online. This is an all all online system. They can they can see and, and chime off on into you know inside that system. Um, and then Sam's team will you know, do their road assessment. They will look at the road mitigation, the traffic mitigation plan. <coughs> Uh, that particular production is submitted and required to submit as part of their permit. Um, and they'll decide whether or not that's an appropriate plan and makes sense. Um, and if there's tweaks made, Sam's team has the authority to, to make those changes and make those requirements um, and set policy around all that, as does the Department of Regional Planning, sets policies around the biodiversity of, of, this, of this county and all the zoning issues. So once those steps are done, in, in the context of a an easy permit. Each department has said yes. The final step is also with Sam's team to look at that permit and ensure that all the departments have given the appropriate approvals. If that's all done and everything's appropriately done, and they will sign off on that permit and send a message back to Film LA. This permit is now approved by the county. You may release that permit to that particular film company. So I just wanted to make sure that sort of that level of detail, step by step, was understood too. Because I don't think people necessarily think about it at that level. But there's a lot of County departments that are involved in the permitting process of uh, in the process of permitting in particular production, depending on those activities. Uh, fire, of course, if the special effects as well, uh, certainly very much involved in that as well. Um, there's a special effects permit that's required to go along with a county permit. Uh, if there's a bus being blown up or a fire being used or you know, any kind of other special effects, you know, sheriff will be on 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 site if there's gunfire going off. So all of these departments are are engaged in the process of permitting. So I just wanted to make sure that was explained to you. Sam, uh, okay. uh, just a quick programming note. Um, the food in the back was generously provided by Film LA from the New Active Market. So please, it's not serving up here, it's for everyone. So if you're hungry, thirsty, whatnot, feel free to walk back in the corners. And yes, it's there when you're done, take it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you filled out a comment card at this point in time, go ahead and hold it up and Chuck's going to come around the room real quick. And if you just got here and you're wondering where comment cards are, um, between fire chairs and the table, yes, perfect. They're sitting on the back table. Once those come up here, we'll start going card by card, question by question. We'll get all your questions answered. So stand by just for a minute. Thank you. Time, by the way, because obviously the discussion will probably spur additional thoughts and questions. So we have plenty of time. So please keep them coming. Okay. First question or series of questions, Chris Troydale. Number one, how was the cumulative effect being measured? And we'll go question by question, Chris. So whoever wants to answer, I'll pass the microphone down. Okay. Again, how is cumulative effect being measured? Cumulative effects of what? Um, I can explain that if in most communities other than ours, if someone did a film shoot next door, it would happen once a year, maybe twice a year. That would be it. But in our immediate area, the Ravina area, there's um, Middleton Ranch, which I believe is probably 40 or 50 acres. Mm -hmm. There's Pulserosa Ranch, which I understand is over 400 acres. There's a new place that's now started filming. They've done several Ill illegal film shoots there. Um, their purchase is 160 acres. There's Lupita's Ranch. Um, the owner is Eric Servana. I believe he's got four parcels that total another couple hundred acres. Cook's There's, Ranch. Uh, excuse me? Cook's Ranch. Uh, so Cook, what's the question? Cook's the Ranch. Question. Well, the cumulative effect is that you've got uh, a few properties here in the middle, and we're now surrounded by over a thousand acres of film ranches that are becoming a commercial environment. And um, we feel like we're living on the back lot of Universal Studios. 
So where, where you could say this property is only used two or three times a week, if then the other four days were off, is the, this property here and this property here, we're being bombarded seven days a week with filming. Is this based on the threshold question, I think, right? Mm -hmm. I think so, because a year, possibly. It, it, appears to, it appears to me, and what I've reviewed, that your, your, um, your measurement so far has been per property, per use, per zoning, but now we're having a cumulative effect that the entire area is becoming commercially used. So I think that the best answer I can give, you don't have a can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know if we can give you a direct answer, but I think we've talked specifically, you and I and Jackie, we've spoken about this through email, um, is sort of the revised revision of the ordinance that's happening now, right? It's a long process where it's regional planning. We've been analyzing other areas in terms of very well, you know, relative to thresholds of filming per year. Uh, what's reasonable, and we're just still looking into that. Um, you know, we have so many different uh, zoning areas in the county as well, too. So, it's a, so I just wanted to share that we are looking into what that looks like, uh, recognizing that, I and mean, this is why we're here today. This is why we've had consistent communication with Acton, because this is a very unique area, right? So, uh, I don't have a straight answer for you. I can't tell you this is how we do it, because we're not there yet. So, but I think we need to consider the changing dynamics, the increase of production, the increase of content that's happening, you know. These are all factors, uh, can, but I don't have an answer for you today. Can I just ask one other question, and I know almost the direct answer if you want me to state it, but um, on your website, or Film LA's website, they have the number of permits pulled. In District 1 and 2, it was a couple hundred or less. District 3 and 4, it was around four or 500. In District 5, which is our district, um, I don't know if it was to date or how the fiscal year goes. So, yeah, it's it's almost a 500% increase just in this area of film permits. And when well, I asked... Decrease in this last year, we've actually had a reduction. <coughs> so a reduction in the last two quarters of filming up here. But the 17, 18, yeah, it was the first time we really took a look at about 1,500 permits for the 5th district as a whole. Yeah, so... It was the full 5th district. Yeah, so I would say more days than not, um, there's notices coming across that there's filming right. across our area. So, I mean, just to know that we're, we're actually thinking about that, we're reviewing that, that's part of the conversations we've had. It's, it's been the inspiration for a lot of these conversations around what we can do to, to kind of coexist with the community and respect the community. So, I think what, what ACTIV has sort of been an example of is, is that inspiration and really taking a deeper look at these policies and procedures. So, we're in process and we will continue to, to work for solutions. Okay. Couple show of hands questions. How many people are landowners in Acton? How many people are repeat are repeat film permit users? Uh, how many times has a monitor been used in the last twenty four months? Well, do you mean by Film LA Monitor or Fire Safety Officer? Fire Safety Officer. Film LA Monitors. I'm unaware of them ever being used in Acton. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Paul, Paul, I, don't have the, I don't have numbers of use. Paul has got the numbers of use. Yeah, I, I was just wondering because I, I was unaware. We can follow up on that question. No problem. Uh, what was the result of your investigation of the bomb that occurred at Bolsa Rosa? <laughs> What was the result of your investigation three, three weeks ago? About three weeks ago, a permit came across my desk saying that there was going to be a uh, some sort of a powder bomb that was going to go off on a certain day of Wednesday. And um, I had sent an email saying this really can occur with our equestrian areas and stuff. What What is this? What, what's the size? Um, the email I got back from Gary said that it was a purely cosmetic type thing, it would barely be heard, it was more or less for an effect. Uh, I'm about a mile and a quarter from Pulserosa Ranch, and when the bomb went off, uh, the horses started kicking the barn, my windows rattled, the neighbors next door had just gotten off of a horse that they were training that they could have been injured on. And when I sent the email off, also um, I had gotten a call immediately from Chris Gallucci over at Shambhala Preserve saying, what the hell was this? Um, this is unacceptable, we can't continue like this. And I sent another email off to you guys, and you said you were going to investigate it, and I never got any response back. So how did that occur? Well, you're asking me for a specific example. I don't have that detail in front of me. But I think we do recall Shambhala Reserve, you know, got uh, reached out, all reached out to them. I think we can get that 
back to you <laughs> specifically. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have the details in front of me, so I can't get into in front of this room the exact details of that, but I might go back and look at the email, look at what I sent you. Um, so you look at that particular permit, because I can't recall. So you don't recall the, the investigation and what you guys looked at? I have to look at the details of the permit. I don't have it on the top of my head right here in this public setting. But I can certainly go back on Monday and take a look at it and forward the emails on to you and the relative to our communication about that. But I know we did have a conversation with some Symbolic Reserve. Um, I did communicate that back to you guys for the year. So, but I can go back and look at what our communication was. And if there's anything that was left off that wasn't explained, happy to correct that and provide information. Yeah, I think my question more, more or less was just how to prevent this in the future since you guys were also unaware of the size of this event. Excuse me, I, I live next door to them and I am the one that was breaking the horse minutes before that went off. I never got any notice. This was, I don't know if you have any idea about horses. We were literally getting on a horse for the first time. Someone could have gotten killed. That was twice as loud as a sonic boom. And we're out there with a horse, putting a person on the horse for the very first time. And when Chris asked about that, about notifying us, and they said, we only have to notify people within a thousand feet. That, uh, as far as animal safety, and I'm just, I don't have a problem with you guys filming yeah. out here, but we live on a crappy road that gets washed out. Yeah. We don't, the train stops our street. We have crappy service. All these things we deal with because we love where we live. We don't have any control of it. Now we're getting filming everywhere, and it's fine if it doesn't put us at risk. And I don't think making a profit trumps our safety. And I train, break, breed horses, and I've got someone coming out to try a horse, and we have that kind of thing. They're also going to have low-flying helicopters. You can't do that with pregnant mares and babies and breaking horses without, if we know, we're fine. We won't work them. We'll put the ones in barns so they can't hurt themselves. We're getting nothing. I have never gotten a notice once. I have a P.O. box. We don't have mailboxes. Not once have I ever been notified. Chris has let me know because he's very involved. Just saying. You guys are doing a really bad job at letting us know and keeping ourselves safe. So, if I can just respond. And first off, absolutely, you know, I, I don't know what to say other than I hear you. We're really sorry that you've had that experience. Um, that is not at all the experience we want any of you to have. I mean, I, and I mean that sincerely. It's really not, that's not the experience we want you to have. You know? So I appreciate that, that you're sharing that with us. This is why we're here today. So, you know, my commitment is we'll have to go back and look at that, uh, you know, that circumstance. I do recall, you know, some of the concerns about this. We, we did not hear, you know, from other residents in terms of, the, you know, other than from Chris. We haven't heard from other folks. I we would love to hear more of that. More about it. Yeah, okay. And I'm sure you did. I'm just saying I don't see everything, you know, obviously I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day of every single thing. But we'll go back and we'll look at it. But sure, also, right. I just, I just sure. also wanted to share that we have the email list of notifications. We really like, really, really encourage people if you can, please sign up for that email list. We want you to be noticed. One comment is enough. Just, you don't need everybody. Let me just finish everybody. back there. And I'll get back to you, Jackie. Sorry. And I'm real quick. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Sharon, so, Sharon, can you just tell them real quick about the automatic gunfire and how they affected your Great Danes also? Oh, yeah. Well, no, I think this is important to hear. Right? Another thing, automatic gunfire and stuff. I have a female Great Dane that people know they have dogs that are afraid of thunder and stuff. She literally busted through my sliding glass, glass window, afraid of it, trying to get away. And again, had I known, I could have put the damn thing in the house. You know, so it, it, most of this is about notification and just being kind to the people yeah. that paid a lot of money to live where we live. You know, and I, again, I absolutely 100%, and I hear you, we hear you. Um, this is the kind of stuff we want to hear, and I think. You know, what we did in the last year and a half with the Acton Town Council specifically, which was just the film committee, which represents the, 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 the region, was to look at what the special conditions are. We did, as Paul mentioned, 
craft, you know, a lot of special conditions um, that we're still testing, we're still analyzing, we're still thinking about. And we're, obviously that's a, not a, a, a dead process. You know, that's an ongoing process we want to continue. The whole, sole goal here is to always be able to make sure that the whole point here Just to make sure that we're. I get, I get notified. Just want to make sure that we're actually okay. hearing everyone okay. speak and that we're hearing the concerns. Good for you. Okay. Sorry. One, one second. I didn't one, hear that. One second. You just said he gets notified every day. I'm sorry? You just said he gets notified every day. Okay. So just in fact, just to make sure that you know, you're able to sign up on the email notification list. We want to make sure folks are, are on that list. We also recognize that many of your properties, you know, we're not going to go on your properties and notice for a variety of reasons. You so know, there's that like notice, a dozen ranches back on Mary Hill. It's not hard to put notices on our door. Well, we're not allowed to in most instances. So I think okay. the issue well, is we struggle with that. You know? yeah. I don't want it's a challenge for us to do the physical posting. I've always had a notice posted on. I never have, ever. Folks, always folks. ever. Folks, I, I, be it's not consistent. One second, one second. second. As far as the noise, folks, if we can direct your questions up this way, that would be very helpful. Because there's multiple conversations going on here. I want to make sure everyone is hearing the question and hearing the response. Okay. Thank you. Um, one second. We're going to move on to another question. Keeping the Croydale family here. Uh, this is from Stephanie. So, uh, when I ride my horses, the noise from the filming and the lights can scare them. It affects my sleep too. How can you fix this? So, can you read it one more time? Do you want to state it yourself? Well, you you feel so compelled. Step yeah, you're welcome to. Yeah, yeah. 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 Grab the card yeah. for that. Not a problem. Yeah. When I ride my horses, the noise from the filming and the lights can scare them. It affects my sleep too. How can you fix this? Get better horses. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This happened during the day when you're riding horses, or yeah. yeah. So there's not a lot of light during the day that affects horses, but certainly sounds would, right? Yeah. yeah. So, no, I think that in our special conditions, um, one of the things that we do, we do have an equestrian or common you know, special condition about, about equestrian properties. That when we know that there are horse properties or livestock properties in the general area of that particular shoot we're reaching out to all of those properties. Now, there's no database that we have um, that lists all the livestock properties in Acton. So a lot of it is what we know from folks like you know, Chris and Jackie and others on the council council have told us about, or location managers, or driving by, or Pauline. It would be really help for us, helpful for us if we could really build a database of some sites, a real strong list where we know where all of these properties are. The jump companies will also work with those properties to relocate animals. There's a cost associated with that that you, know, you would work directly with those production companies on. But it is important for us to do that external survey. That's an ever-evolving process. Clearly, this is a huge concern, and we want to make sure we're addressing your concerns. So we need to continue to evolve that notification process of livestock properties. We will. I mean, I think that's, that's the thing that we want to hear about. We don't want you to be in this situation where you feel, as you obviously many of you have shared, that your animals are scared and they're getting spooked. And, and that's not the goal, right? So what we can do to alleviate that, we're here to, to figure that out. So, but it is a condition in the existing special conditions of Acton. Um, I think our challenge is where these properties are um, and at what, what level of outreach can we do. And then relative to the physical posting too, I just, just wanted to cap that off. It's not consistent across that. And some properties absolutely do not come on my property. We won't. Um, we've been instructed very sternly from property owners off in the past do not post anything on our property. So we don't. PO boxes is another thing where it's not always the best way. So we're just trying a bunch of different angles, you know, um, including the email list, posting in the market. You know, it's just a very unique community to get those notices out. But we're committed to making sure we do it the best possible way we can. Okay, question. This whole guy's an asshole. Dialogue question. How did so many restrictions occur this quickly? I'm from a family of developers in Chicago. My fear is that this smoke and mirrors for a classic land grab by developers. 
break the business of moving ranches, force them out of business, then swoop in and buy their land cheap for future development of homes. Is this a possibility? Is this a possibility? And then first question again, how did so many restrictions occur this quickly? Yeah. I can't answer the zoning question of what would happen if uh, who you're in trying to business and what kind of zoning would happen uh, to allow or not allow that. Uh, but the restrictions, many of them exist before. Um, when we do special conditions, we start from the standards and add additional things, working with your community, uh, the town council, the supervisor's office, and others. Um, I think the, the question sort of behind this was one that we've heard back and forth, which is why weren't why wasn't public notice, in essence, given to the people who support or have filming to participate in those meetings? Um, and they were, many of them came out of the town council's public meetings and were noticed according to their rules and, and the county rules. But it, it really wasn't that fast. I don't think the town council would say that we moved quickly enough or far enough uh, along with the county. But uh, the truth of it is, as I said, this is a unique community in many ways. We're all being more and more educated about it. Uh, and in order to prevent, this is why we did things like add an e-notice, which we manage. We have a list as we get more and more notices from people that they have livestock of any kind. We have the list to share. Um, and when you get a chance to go online and look at those special conditions, you'll see that as soon as any kind of gunfire is included, the notice area expands. And in some cases, because what we're learning about geography, it gets even wider based on what we know about uh, and have reports back about canyon and movement of noise. So we're constantly trying to move to those places. Um, the question about how fast, I'm not sure uh, that it was all that fast, but for a lot of people it became a sudden notice to them because it's the first time they were exposed to the new uh, rules that are out there. Yeah, there, there's no magic around that. That's not what the department does. No. Well, there are no permitted film ranches anyway. Not yet. Not one. Uh, you just that? No, said film. You said film ranches. Can you read the question again? Why suddenly is there such a major slowdown of filming? The question was the people that benefit from shooting. The question was how so many restrictions occurred this quickly. This year, the, the, the description was I'm from a family of developers in Chicago. My fear is that this is smoke and mirrors for a classic land grab by developers. Uh, break the business of movie ranchers, force them out of business, and swoop in and buy their land cheaper for future development of homes. This is possible. Which what is the zoning? Can you do that? Uh, the, the zoning varies. Depends on <coughs> property, but more than likely, most of the properties in Acton are zoned either A2, which is heavy agricultural, or A1, light agricultural. Uh, movie ranches, uh, permanent movie ranches, would says they're only permitted in the A2 zone with the CUP. The CUP is a conditional use permit. And there are no CUPs in Acton as of today. For movie ranches, right? Um, I'll get back to you. I don't have the numbers, but uh, there's a couple properties that are going through this process right now. Ulster Rosa, Middleton, uh, soon, you know, maybe one more. But no CPs of an issue, correct? Uh, I, I'll get back to you. I can certainly get the numbers correct. Yeah. 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 Um, it, was, it was a recommendation that you all shared with us. Was, you know, what is that definition? When do we look at a property? This has to tie into this threshold idea. When do we then say, okay, you need to see your now, right? So that's been a really helpful uh, trigger as well. It came out of the active conversation. So we're looking at what that looks like um, because some properties who want to host filming, you know, whatever, it's an arbitrary number. Let's just say it's four or five times a year, and that comes out to be, I don't know, 15 shoot days. You know. Um, that is that uh, now that the CUP, and I think we have to really ask ourselves some questions based on the impact of community, other best practices elsewhere in the country, what does that mean? And I think that's some of the conversations that we're having not only just up here within regional planning, but across the whole county. So where, where this applies, but I just wanted to put you, put that out to folks too, that we're having that conversation of what constitute, constitutes needing a CUP and what's reasonable, 
and what's business friendly and what's community friendly, right? How do you balance that all out? We have not reached that way, but it's in process. So. Gary, we have one question. Yeah. What would be the difference with the private property owner that was allowing somebody to film on their property when they got their permits from you guys? Yeah, yeah. And one that is required to have a CUP. What does the CUP actually do? Well, I mean, I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Well, we know what a CUP does, but the first part of your question is when do they need that CUP? No, but why would they need the CUP? Right, so what if it's is a, the reason it's a that real they would business, have to get the cut? I mean, it's a justifiable business, like a movie ranch, like Disney Ranch, or other ranches, Pulse of Rose, others who have a long history. It is their business, you know, special events, you know, other types of events like that. I think that, in many cases, is easily understood because you can look at a business license, you can look at the intent of a business. Uh, so the definition of what is, what's, the definition of needing a CUP, what that may look like, is what we're, we're looking at. But ultimately, but in the short term, as in a community or whatever, it doesn't make a difference regarding filming or disruption or not disruption or any of the above, so right? I'll let the zoning come say to that. Yeah. That level. One, one clear item or distinction would be if they have permanent sets. Sets or they may have a office trailer where they operate that movie ranch. So that's one definitely clear distinction. Uh, movie sets, any kind of sets that are left there on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. And that would. And how much does it cost us to do the CUP in this area? Like in this area, just start. Question is how much does it cost to do a CUP? Yeah. Well, the question is how much does it cost to do a CUP? I can answer that. <laughs> you or Oscar could probably answer that question. A lot. A lot. Uh, the CUP right now, I think, runs around uh, 9,000 plus additional fees, uh, depending on the project. Um, so, definitely uh, 9 plus. Does the town benefit from that? Definitely, I can you know, if you give me the permission, I can give you the extra cost. I'm sorry. His estimate of 9,000 to acquire a CUP. It's absolutely insane. The initial fee is like so. As you go through this process, that is not where we're trying to come from. But I, again, we appreciate your experiences and what you're sharing with us and what it's been like for you, because that helps us on our end look at what we need to be paying attention to. Okay, this is a clean hands waiver. And DRP can talk folks through that. Do you want to just answer that real quick and we'll move on to this? Yeah, the clean hands waiver is um, basically a, a, a process where um, someone finds themselves in, the, in violation of the zoning code, um, and the code basically says that you cannot operate a use without a, a permit. Um, so if the clean hands waiver process applies in that respect, then we can talk to the property owner about the process. But as Gary said, you know, um, the situations where even though there may be violations in a particular location, um, the county may allow them to continue operating with certain restrictions um, until they get the full CUP, which then that's where the department has a chance to look at all the environmental impacts of that use and then adopt appropriate conditions. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, particular question here, film permit F00149497 was approved by CEO a few weeks ago. It authorized filming at 5726 Soledad, which included prep at 4 a.m. Fireballs, dust explosions, and condor lights. Only six residents were surveyed, even though there are more than nine residents located within a half mile of the film area in the middle of 5726 Sold Ave. Um, CEO will not identify which properties were surveyed, so the number of residents actually captured by the survey cannot, cannot be ascertained. CEO approved half a mentioned number, despite receiving at least one survey response stating opposition based on problems created by filming one week earlier involving hungry helicopter activities. Uh, question. Uh, number one, why did CEO approve this disruptive film shoot without surveying all residents within one mile? Just a couple other questions. Again, why did CEO approve this disruptive film shoot without surveying all residents within one mile? Are you familiar with that particular address? Uh, I am not. So we're not going to get into specific conversations about permits because we're not prepared to do that. I will, if you send me an email, wherever that card is from. Um, I'm happy to look into it. It was strange, Angel, and it was me. Okay. Sorry. So I'm not going to so get into the conversation on public forums. It's a long time. Oh, no, ask the question. Do you want to ask the question? Oh, yes. And this is also verified. The CEO does not approve permits. We've had this conversation. DRP, Damn it, Public Works, rather, is the county entity that approves permits. I do not approve permits. So I just want to make sure that's clear because we've had this conversation many, many times. The public Works is the permitting authority that approves the panel of final permits. Um, I see them when there's a problem, but I don't have approval authority.
the CEO to sign. Three other questions related to this. Uh, why did CEO approve this film shoot despite opposition noted in the survey results? Again, I don't have the data in front of me, so I can't answer that question. But I will follow up with an email with Jackie about it. What changes did CEO make in the permit to address residents' concerns? What was the last part? Uh, what changes did CEO make in the permit to address resident concerns? <coughs> I will look at the permit and I will refer to the, the email on that communication chart. And finally, how will CEO ensure in future that all residents are surveyed before film activity is initiated? And that filming does not proceed, there is opposition noted in the survey. So as a policy comment, we always survey folks. Uh, oftentimes we get public records requests for those surveys, they will always be redacted. Um, you're not allowed to provide private information. You're always That's not the question. So what I'm saying to folks is that when we get a public records request from folks, if you want the surveys, we're not going to give you the names and addresses of, of those folks that are surveyed. We survey where it's necessary and the activity is such that requires a survey. Um, but in terms of ensuring that all the folks in the general radius, which is generally 300 and can change depending on the circumstance, um, we try to listen to everybody. I'm not really sure what else I can answer. The question was, questions. how do you ensure you that you survey, survey everybody, and how do you incorporate a opposition well, What does surveying everybody mean? Like, we're not going to survey three miles around us. No, sheet. how do you ensure that everybody should be surveyed within a half a mile or a mile? Are Depends surveyed. on the activity, based on the special conditions that we create for action. How do you confirm that they're all surveyed? Because we get them back from the production company. So when there are 20 houses around within half a mile, a quarter right. of a mile, right. and you get five surveys back, are you are you confident that all 20 homes have been surveyed? I don't know. Do you want to answer that question? So we switch numbers pretty fast in that group. So surveys are, are done in certain circumstances. Uh, they're done uh, by the production company and turned into Film LA uh, with information about all the areas they were required to survey by address. They indicate um, on to us and also on the survey itself has the indication of whether or not the person had raised an issue, what the issue was, and whether or not they had any concerns, no concerns, and then those are all recorded and become part of the pro of the package that goes forward. There is not, this is not a percentage requirement. I think I said that earlier. 51% no does not necessarily mean the county will reject it or that we recommend it. Because frequently what happens is the immediate response is, how do you deal with that person's problem that was identified in the survey? Um, and often, we'll get a note back from the person that was surveyed or from the company about resolution to the issues. All of this ends up in the package that goes forward. There are times, and they're not infrequent, throughout the entire region we serve, where the surveys are not accomplished the first time they go around because nobody's home or they're not able to reach the person. And they make a second attempt, and sometimes they've been asked to go back and do third attempts, depending on the activity. If they're never able to reach someone, or that survey that's been left is not returned, and phone calls are not made, it's notified on that group of list that they were unable to make contact. All that information together becomes part of a decision about whether to approve the permit or not. It is not a numbered system. It's a total circumstance of all the information we have, all the attempts made, and what the end result of the surveys were, go forward for final decisions on approvals or amending those permits. So how are, the question was, how are opposition comments incorporated in the permit and the permit changed to make sure that those opposition concerns are addressed? So there are two different questions there. One was how are the opposition comments recorded? The opposition comments are passed on as part of the entire package of the permit application. There may or may not be a decision by the permit authority or the individual department affected by those comments to amend the permit. So that's how it works. They go forward, a decision's made whether it's going to impact or not. If it impacts, they tell us to change the language on the permit. We do that. Uh, but it is not an automatic response that something is going to be changed because it may be something that gets resolved in a different way than, than doing the permit. So, so all the information goes forward. Which department requests or amends the permit to address, for example, noise? So if noise is the issue, and that's what the person identifies, the noise 
complaint as part of the process goes forward to the various agencies. And in this case, noise stuff would probably end up both at planning and in the end at public works. But the issue, the question becomes, and we've seen this happen recently in some of the permits, the permit may be backed off for the request of the amount or the, there's a whole technology around special effects of getting down from full to three quarter to half to quarter to what's called non-gun gunfire. And it may be that the request goes back and it is reduce the load used. It may be that the person is accommodated in another way by the film company through payment or having them move. That happens a lot in downtown areas where they have to make noise. So there isn't a specific answer or response, but all of the information that comes in in those surveys is passed on and is responded to in some way or another. <coughs> Assuming, you know, and I, I don't make the policy judgments on this, but sometimes the issue that's coming forward is not one that is actually a policy problem, it's something else. Uh, so that's how it works, and all the information goes forward and decisions are made in what I would call totality of circumstance by the various agencies. Jack, you want to get through a few more questions here. Uh, another circumstance here, between January 29, 2019 and March 25, 2019, county CEO approved 19 film permits in Acton. 17 of them did not comply with the Acton film standards developed by CEO. <coughs> CEO has stated that film productions are encouraged to comply with these Acton film standards, but they are not required to and are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, question number one, on what criteria does the county rely in determining whether to approve a permit that does not comply with acting film standards? A series of questions. Um, well, the first part about the data, the number of permits that, again, our office did not approve, the county did, which is the permitting authority. I don't have that data, so I'm not going to respond to that. I can't accurately respond to it. In terms of um, adhering to special conditions, as I mentioned earlier in our process discussion around the flow, all of the special conditions are discussed with the production at the point of um, the application. So those are all gone through. We don't, we don't allow people to not adhere to the special conditions. There has been an ongoing belief that the 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. is some hard line rule, and it's never been a hard line rule. It's a guideline. So when there's a filming that wants to shoot outside of the 10 p.m. time frame, that's when we often do these surveys with surrounding communities. Uh, I do not recall any instance in which we have approved a permit that is not aligned with the acting special conditions. Uh, so that, that would be the county's response to that question. Uh, what approval thresholds does CEO use in determining whether to approve a permit that does not comply with the acting standards? I would answer that question earlier. Yeah. Uh, three, has the CEO ever denied a film permit because it does not comply with that film standards? Again, I don't have a specific data, but yeah, I can assume in the past we've seen conditions that are not, you know, situations that don't apply uh, wouldn't be appropriate. And we've had that conversation. We've had film productions also come back because they've reached out to the acting community and the town council and have realized, you know, this is probably not good for the community, so we're going to adjust and we're going to take this activity away. But we often hear, as Paul said earlier, when we notice film permits, they're draft, right? So that notice that goes out is, a, is generally in draft form because over the course of the 72 hour requirement to put out a, uh, to notice before a film shoot happens, things change. And that conversation goes back and forth with the production. They are become aware of the conditions. They'll do some outreach to the community. Many productions do it on their own without even talking to us. They just understand the importance of reaching out to community. And most productions are really great, good actors. They're good partners, you know. They want to work with the community. So, you know, it, it's not a hard line, this is how it goes, it's always black and white, and this is, these are the steps, one, two, three, four, you know? It's, it's a process um, where the needs of the community are taken into consideration, so. And a couple more questions, again, I want to make sure Jack's questions get on the record, and you've alluded yeah, to some sure. of this here, but on what grounds would CEO deny a film permit for not complying with the film standards? And yeah. following up on that, what were the compelling reasons the county relied upon to justify approving 17, 19, sorry, 17 of 19 film permits that were not consistent with the acting film standards. Again, I don't have fact to back up that that's the case, so I can't respond to that last one. Okay. Next question, why doesn't Acton get any monetary benefit from all this filming, even if it's in the form, even if it's in the form of town improvement? 
Yeah, I mean, I make uh, regional plans. The public work will also respond. So this is a good question. Uh, we get this from a lot of communities, uh, not just some of them, but other areas. So uh, Acton is supported, as you know, the municipal services are provided by the county. It's unincorporated. So public works uh, is one of our, obviously, bigger municipal departments. So all your roads are taken care of through uh, public works, any other kind of issues that come up the streets, you know, fire, obviously, sheriff. So the money that is collected through film, filming, which is quite minimal, by the way, in terms of the county side, it goes into the general fund. These go back out into a fund that then helps as one of the many funding streams that the, the services that you all get in your community. That's sort of how it works. So it's all of the unappropriate areas in the county. So I don't say what you have better. I'm going to say it's more to how that, that well, works, well, but okay, well, that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, the, I understand that the county family is rather large. Uh, film permit fees um, are collected in different manners depending on the department. Uh, I know with public works, our fees are really for cost recovery. We don't gain from uh, filming activities. We we the film fees are to allow staff uh, to review the permits to make sure that the uh, the uh, applicable or the correct permit conditions are being applied and they are being applied with because we do have our road permit inspectors that go out there to monitor. They don't monitor the entire duration of the film shoot, but they want to make sure that uh, whatever is being affected on the public road right of way uh, is consistent with the permit conditions. Uh, so the fees are really just for the cost of our review of the permit and for the inspections. Uh, there's really no other benefit to our department. Thank you, Sam. Um, next question is, if Film LA has no enforcement authority and if there's no county employee present, who enforces permit conditions? One more time, if Film LA has no enforcement authority, and if there's no county employee present, who enforces permit conditions? So uh, the question about that, we're 24 seven and that's who you call when something isn't working um, on odd hours. We don't have the ability to revoke. We have the ability to cajole and request compliance. But we do have access to uh, those who can enforce. And frequently, um, especially up in areas here, we've had great relationships with the Sheriff's Department and the County Fire, who will go out when we call them and say that there's a problem, there's a concern. Um, our on the, on the ground person up here also goes out uh, for us when we have those problems. And so in the end, the potential for the withdrawal of it, if it's during a time in business day when we can reach any of the staff, uh, we'd ask them to help with the question about whether the permit gets revoked or not. But if it's after hours, weekends, when they're not in, we directly relate to law enforcement or LA County Fire to request help with those enforcements. That was my question. And filming on Shannondale two weeks ago, um, all the filming, all the parking was supposed to be on private property. It was not. The cars completely, virtually blocked Shannondale, Shannon Valley Road. Excuse me. And the, uh, there was a sheriff's department person there, and he did not require, he did not require any compliance with the permit conditions, and people had a difficult time getting out of their, their homes. And so even if there is a sheriff there, the compliance is not met, and nobody looks at the permit to see what the conditions are and looks around to see if they're being met. So I don't know if anyone from sheriffs wants to talk about that, but Jack is saying you guys don't look at the permits or enforce them. Just to clarify, the <laughs> 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 and, and we, we provided pictures, and it's Shannondale, but, and you might be aware of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the situation that happened the other day. So I think part of the problem, which we are kind of fixing it, and I can speak from my personal experience before becoming your guys' town sheriff, I was not familiar with a lot of these very unique issues that we have out here with the illegal filming, with the illegal dumping, and normal patrol is not usually very, you know, adapt to this stuff. You know, over the course of the last month or so of kind of getting to know what that process entails, I didn't even know that LA, you know, film LA existed, to be honest with you. I'm in the process of getting everyone up to speed at the station level, because that happened after hours. Uh, the unit did take all sorts of information from it. You got phone numbers, you got IDs, you know, you got a lot of good stuff. 
But what so, we want is compliance. No, I get that. <laughs> I get that. And like, and now that we know what the procedures are as far as how to enforce it, that we can enforce it under the civil code, and be able to, you know, proceed further with either a citation or a, a DA letter filing kind of thing like that, where you basically write a report. Uh, we need to confiscate the um, equipment if we need to as evidence. Um, that kind of thing, and then shut down the production there, and then the DA's office files it on the back end kind of thing. That should solve the problem, but it's getting that information out there that 100% honest, it's not us. Like, we didn't, we didn't, like, it's not, like, well known. Okay? But you aren't on all film Right, I get shoots, that. That's, that's right? why I'm, that's, no, I'm not. So, so it, no, it, I mean, it, the it, Sheriff's it, Department is not on all sh film shoots. No, so. it, depends, it depends on the area. A lot of it is highway patrol because of the closures of the roads, and we're all aware of if it's a traffic issue, it's highway patrol. If it's not, it's us. But it's still the same thing, just because it's after hours and there may or may not be, a, a, you know, it might be a CHP issue or because of the road or whatever. We still call the sheriff's station. We'll still respond if we need to get highway patrol out there. We'll get them out there. Um, but once the information is disseminated to the entire station, because the other thing is, Captain Shaver had another engagement. He wanted to be out here for you guys uh, to support you guys. Notice it's a little bit different with him now here. He's actually coming to town hall and he's engaging me constantly on what's going on out here. Um, and he is concerned about this. He wanted to be out here. He wants that information for everyone to be on the same page. He wants all his deputies to know what to do for this kind of stuff and what kind of enforcement we can do and help you guys out. So that's unfortunately sometimes we're a little you know, retroactive uh, on these kind of things. But can I yeah. just make a statement question, yeah. kind of, because um, I've been on even a week ago, two sheriffs showed up in a legal film shoot. They were totally unaware of what was legal, what wasn't. Right, and that's what I'm saying. Like, that's, they, that's they the did, issue. They did do the right thing eventually. I explained to them what I had, and I said, you know, here, here's the deal. I said, I'm just a citizen. I'm telling you what I know, but I know it's hearsay. I said, Film LA has a 24-hour hotline. You can call them directly. I was there in sight. And I said, you can call them directly and get it from the horse's mouth of what requires and doesn't require a permit. Um, and then they opted just to go and, and shut that illegal film shoot down. And then on another instance, a few weeks, maybe a month or so ago, there was a shoot, and uh, I am notified of all these film permits. And there was a shoot where they were doing the road closure, or supposed to be filming from Crown Valley North and South on Soledad Canyon, that typical area that's closed. And they were about a mile uh, south of that at Bootlegger Canyon. And I got calls from my neighbors because I'm kind of a, the guy that everyone calls. And at the same time, it was just a coincidence. There was a broken down school bus at the corner, and everyone thought the school bus was part of the filming, and it was blocking half the road. And when I went to the highway patrol, um, I says, are you guys filming outside of your permitted area? And he goes, yeah, I think we're a little bit outside. I said, well, are you, you going to shut them down or tell me the order? He goes, it's not my job. because I'm just here to provide traffic control. So they were a mile a, away from there. That was, that was another area. issue. Okay. So well, what I would task you guys with is, the council and us don't have to be involved, but I would task you guys with whoever is going to be hired for these film shoots, whoever's going to be patrolling active nights, to get some sort of training done for all your guys to film away. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I can definitely pass that along that when anyone gets hired for the... I mean, I, I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't think you're dealing with that many codes and that many ordinances that it would take that much, but I think anyone who works in this area should be educated because filming is 500% more in this area than anywhere else. Correct. Uh, you know, and, and going off that, if there was an issue with the, or the higher control or whatever, you have an issue, again, you can always call the sheriff's station, okay? And the guys know that I'm very accessible. They have my personal cell phone. A lot of the town council have my, my cell phone and stuff. They can get a hold of me. And I, I have no problem taking calls or writing back emails after hours or whatever. And, and I appreciate that because one of the other issues that contradicts what uh, Paul Aldley said, and, and I don't mean to be conflicted, but what Paul said is that his people have very good relationships with you guys. But the other night when I called, because I know the process, um, before I did anything, I called Film Only first and said, do you have a film shoot happening on Hefner Road? Um, I got a call back in a very timely manner, and then the gal was very nice, and she says, no, that's got to be an illegal film show, we have no permits issued. And I says, are you going to call the Sheriff's Department? Because it seems better if it's coming from a public entity than it would from a, a citizen. And she says, no, we don't do that. We only handle um, the permits that are issued. So if it was any other citizen calling, I'm sure they're aware of it, I've sent them emails, but if it was any other citizen calling, they would make the phone call and go to bed, and it would have died right there. It would have never made it to you guys. So, you know, there's, there's, there's things going on in the process that we work on. I mean, you guys work it out when you're doing your training. Yeah, I just want to just modify a couple. 
So yeah, I mean that was actually a great uh, incident for us because we stand up. Um, because what it did, I mentioned this to you in my email to you, is we did have a conversation with Sheriff this week and with council and sort of clarifying. So we're going to do some internal uh, education amongst our two departments to make sure that everyone understands the full breadth of their uh, enforceability authority. Um, so we're pretty clear on that now. So we'll, you know, that we want to be real on that, but we're very clear. Um, and so what that did do, though, that situation. Uh, was highlight that misunderstanding. Also, Martinez is going to the new. We do actually have a very strong relationship with the sir, so we're happy to do some trainings, and this is great to identify that issue. Um, but to know that the sheriff can actually shut down that issue, it's illegal. Um, in terms of Phil LA's uh, responsibilities, I don't know in that particular situation, but they do often call the sheriff if they know of an illegal film shoot. I don't think that there is a matter as much of a customer resident or from us. I think if you know, as you did in this case, call the sheriff. The MLA is not, nor is the county, we can, can't control illegal film, right? I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing, we want to get on it, we're trying to get on top of it, but in the context of film permitting, it's not part of their responsibility. Um, however, you know, how we address it, the timely manner by which we address it, that is our responsibility, and we hear it. And we want to make sure that we also know, and you mentioned this, just made the suggestion, we need to have this conversation. If we know of a property where illegal film permitting has happened in the past, What's our response going to be for that problem? Yes. So we haven't had a reached an answer on that, but that was a good point to make that we're having that conversation. What is, you know, what punitive action can the county take or should take on that property that has a history of verifiable, you know, illegal permitting situations? This case that we're talking about has a police report number, which is great because that legally allows us to kind of move forward and putting some, laying down some. some and, I, and I appreciate that. It just, it just seemed in, in my mind and. I think several I businesses that a, a great backup plan would be if someone calls Film LA with a film complaint and it's verifiably there's no permit issue, yeah. that the next step with them to make one phone call as a backup plan to the sheriff's department. Yeah, typically we do that, Chris. I think when I spoke to the staff person uh, in the conversation, she said you identified that you'd already called the sheriff and so you didn't duplicate the call. But typically when we get unpermitted film calls, we do make the call directly. Yeah, I was, well, always one, one second, one second, one second. We had a question here. Let me go over here first. Sorry. Good question. I actually want to make a statement. Uh, I'm from the other side. I'm a location manager. So here's, I've been listening intently to what's going on here. Uh, what I like to say about what happens, I'll stand up. What I like to say about what happens with, with film production, well, they were out, they, they, were, they were filming on the road and, you know, they were outside of the permitted area. Things change. Uh, I like to say that everything that we, that we tell the permit office, that we tell Film LA, is chiseled and sand. Because it changes. It's not because we, as the location people, who are the front line interacting with your community and with Film LA. It's not that we, we just you know make this stuff up. There are other people that change things there. That going outside of the, the closure on Soledad Canyon, well, somebody said, you know, wouldn't it be cooler if we went further down this way? Well, it's outside of the zone that we can control. But can we do it legally? And can we do it safely? If we have CHP with us, can they provide uh, escort so that we're doing it safely, not hold up traffic? The great thing about Soledad Canyon is you own it. That's great. But the cinematographer decides, you know, it's much cooler if we're down there because it's better backlight, blah, blah, blah. It's like, OK. Can we do this? Is this okay, CHP? Is this something that you think we can do safely? It's all about safety. You know, and it might be outside of that specific permitted area, but it can be done safely. When I, as someone who, as you can tell by the color of my hair, has been doing this for a while, hear about the fact that there is a non-union crew or an unpermitted crew that's shooting in your community or anywhere, it, it makes my teeth hurt. Because of the fact that it's, it's, it's wrong from a liability standpoint, they're stupid. Why would they do that? I don't know. But it pains me because I'm sitting here and came out here today because I'm as concerned as I am about what's going on in Active and filming in general in the entire region. And, you know, it, we're, we're just trying to do what's right. Location managers are trying to do what's right. Productions. Some of them are idiots. I mean, I'll always say, you know, I work with film crews, they're idiots. But by and large, especially those of us who are more professional, 
and I like to think of myself and those of my colleagues that I see here today are the ones who are the pros. We're trying to do what's right. We're trying to take care of you while having this, this machine behind us that's constantly pushing, 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 pushing. We need, we need, we need, we need, we need. Well, we don't really need, we want. And all we can do is try and hold the line as much as possible. And when knuckleheads come out here and do things that are stupid, it just, it hurts. It hurts me, it hurts everyone in our community. I just want to, if I could just jump in on that too. A couple, one thing I just wanted to, I think it's really important to clarify the first part. First, thank you for sharing your experience, and I think it's helpful to hear that side. Um, but just to be clear, when a permit says this is the area that you can film in, you cannot go outside that permit. There's no, I get you say reality is what it is, and say no, 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 but, but I just want to, let me just, I just want to clarify that it's really important. And this is a really important issue for this community for you to come and say that in some cases we may go out and because see Because I've been filming for so long, let me I'm just sorry. Finish. In that sir, let me, you could. let me just but you're right. Sir, let me just finish. I really need you to give me. We cannot go outside the permit. Because that is a bad acting. That's bad acting. So please, I appreciate your, your permit and forgive my passion on this, but I think it is, it's a little bit hot because this is a huge issue for this community. And I don't think it's helpful for them to hear their production sometimes thinks that, well, we could go a few feet outside of our permit. You can't. I'm sorry. All right, just so just, just I can cap it on that. I just want to make sure. I retract that statement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not go outside the permit. Ever. Thank you. I'm, that's seriously, all I just want to make sure. Say, I've been we're saying, saying that loud and clear. I've been showing up in Santa Clarita since 1980. I get it. And back in the day, there were things we could do that we can't do now. Sorry, my apologies. Let's have that conversation again. I know you can get letters for things, so I'm just saying you can get letters to go outside of that. Correct. That's a different scenario. I'm sure that that's something he left out because I have worked with him. I appreciate you. He's done that. So I'm just. All right. We're going to take one more question in the back. I got to move on to the A lot of people that aren't in the film industry that don't understand how it works. Special conditions work as a menu. So when you're a location manager and your job is writing on whether or not I'm going to be able to do the project I want to do, you can go on the internet, Film LA has active special conditions on their website. Because of the special conditions that were implemented in November, you've lost several million dollars already this quarter. You will lose 10 to 20 million dollars a year every single year that these special conditions, which were approved by your active council remain in place. And one of the men who is responsible and key for having those special conditions implemented is Mr. Christopher Crosdale. How are you, Chris? Uh, so yes, so yes, but there are sorry, people standing you. in this room, myself included, Dan Selber, Middleton Ranch, Marjorie Podraska. The fee for applying for a CEP right now is $21,790. I have had no sets. I have been working on a CEP on a property in Abadolsi. I've spent $230,000 over 17 years. I still do not have my CEP. So the bottom line is not complicated. If people in Acton want filming, you can't have special conditions that say to the film industry, you can't film here. That's how it is. You have a menu. Right now, the menu for filming in Acton is hot poo, steamy poo, liquid poo, lumpy poo, uh, poo with carrots, poo with raisins, or more poo. That's your film menu for filming in Acton. So if you want people to film in Acton, it's got to be, we want you to film in Acton. And then we have this problem. So God bless code enforcement. That's who controls film in LA. God bless Gary Smith. Um, he was instrumental in writing six pages of restrictions to stop filming in this area. And got the Cold Out of the Year Award for it. Good job there, Gary. God bless Paul Oddly. He is in the worst situation anybody could be in. He is at the mercy of code enforcement, and he does what he's told to do. He's a puppet. Okay. So what do we do? What do we do? We should attack. We should attack. We're going to move on to the next question. Shut down. Shut down. Shut down the people that film without a permit. Shut down, without a permit. Shut down the people that break the law. Sir, we're going to move on to the next question. Thank you, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If we want to get through your questions, we need to keep moving. I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you guys off. I know this is.
This is inflaming passion, we totally understand. Uh, next question, why does Phil Mellay charge so much for a small show, i.e. two actors, crew five, recently the permit was 1500 a third of the budget? Huh? I'm going to read again. Paul. No, I understand the question. Um, so some of that is us, some of that is fees that are charged by our uh, partners in, in the government for it. Uh, and right now, we are under a standard fee situation for film permits. So they have a standard cost, so does notification. Um, the Board of Film LA has been working on looking at different ways to try to break the permits down based on impact. Um, there was a discussion several years ago about doing it by budget, but we know budgets are not always truthful, uh, and so that won't work. But we are in the process of trying to figure out how we can look at it for uh, breaking it down by impact on community as opposed to a standard across the board fee. Um, and we'll be going back out to the industry and our government partners about that ability because, and this is not a limitation, right now our fee schedules are included in our contracts. So we'll go back and suggest changes that we think may work for that. Uh, but we have to talk with the industry because if we're reducing costs at the bottom um, for the smallest impact, we have to increase costs for the largest impact films because we do not get paid by any of the governments we serve. It's a free service to the communities and to the governments we serve. And in order to continue doing the work, we have to be able to have a balanced budget. Uh, and so that's the answer to whoever that was, is we're looking at it, we understand the problem, and we would much rather have people um, able to afford to take out the permit rather than have to go rogue and go under because the cost is too much for them to do the work. So we are trying to at this point. Thank you, Paul. Um, next question. I'm mic'd up here. Yes, you are. <laughs> Can you reiterate the process regarding the Film LA Monitor? How, when are they assigned? How much time are they on set? So film LA monitors in some cases are required for specific locations. Um, for example, it's, if you film at City Hall in Los Angeles, you're required to have a film LA monitor in addition to certain staff from the city. Um, there are many cases where the film industry actually will request one of our monitors because uh, they want that interaction uh, to be happening between our staff rather than having to stop production uh, when they go forward. Uh, and in some cases, the jurisdiction where we're serving will ask us to assign a monitor to a particular shoot for whatever reason. There are different circumstances depending on uh, how that situation works out and what we're asked to do. But typically, our monitors arrive at least a half hour, sometimes an hour before production. And they don't leave until production has left the scene. That's the standard. Sometimes they're asked to do spot checks on, at the beginning of a shoot to make sure everybody's where they're supposed to be and then they may uh, come back in the middle of the day to make sure things haven't expanded. But that's how it works. Okay. Um, let's see. We support local filming and the economic benefits it brings to the community. Is there any plan uh, to explore the creation of an acting filming office? Uh, no, I mean, at this point, there, there's not. We do have uh, Pauline East, who's here. Pauline, if you can stand up, folks don't know who you are. Pauline, uh, she's really our point person up here, so I mean she's contracted with MLA, but she has an independent uh, persona as well. Uh, so, so the Elo Valley Film Office is under Pauline, no, it's not a county it's, you know, office, but it serves the county and assists with us. So in that case, that, that's how it that works. Okay. Uh, has the purchase of multiple properties by the MRCA, on Recreation Conservation Authority, uh, spurred the SEA uh, area restrictions and red flag for permitting? Please explain sensitive ecological areas. Again, has MRCA purchased properties? Is that having any effect on permitting? From getting to the point of the question. No, the MRCA was not the reason for the SEAs. Um, I think about 2015, the department uh, went through a process of uh, expanding the SCAs, and, and the department did approve uh, an expansion of, the, of some areas, um, but the, the MRCA was not the reason for the SCAs. The SCAs are, uh, that stands for Significant Ecological Area, um, and basically they're defined as uh, areas which have uh, irreplaceable biological resources, have to do uh, maybe with uh, species, animals, plants, 
or just the area, like a old woodland or a watershed. Um, but again, they're known as uh, areas with uh, irreplaceable biological resources. Um, we are also in contact in the, in the process in the county, as part of the revised revision of the ordinance, the film ordinance, is looking at some of these significant, so get a lot of excuse me, water. Significant ecological areas, hard to, hard to say that. Um, because there's some situations where an SEA has been disturbed historically, um, and filming is allowed in it, but then there's seas that, of course, we don't want anyone near. So, I mean, we're just trying to look at what does that mean, right? Because there's some, nobody knows the full history, maybe some folks have heard of you, but some seas, you know, a long time been disturbed, right? Filming is thus being allowed in it. Um, we don't know. It's just a challenging conversation to have. So we have a division that's not Oscar's team, but another division of biologists, the biologists uh, in regional planning. They are looking at uh, updating this new ecological area ordinance as well. So we're, we're just trying to make sure we understand the nexus back to the kind of things we do with filming too. So it's a data line. Could, could Oscar just quickly mention what a hillside, um, the, or, the hillside restriction is? Hillside management area? Yeah, hillside uh, management. Uh, yeah, hillside management area is basically an area that's um, uh, that has a, a slope of 25 percent or greater. Um, there, there are some restrictions. Um, the, the, my department does have an ordinance, post that match ordinance, um, but generally that has to do with uh, how much grading is done, how much grading. Um, not necessarily, you know, if you do a you know a 10 by 10 green area, uh, you may not be subject to the hillside master area. So it all depends on the project. Uh, but I think the, the most important aspect would be is whether or not it's in the SCA area or not. Thank you. <coughs> Does the, the conservancy, is, do they go through permitting like this or they can just film on their property? Well, they, have a they, they go through the same process of... Yeah, not a CUP, no. just no, a no, film. No, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm asking about as far as the conservancy. It's like when you're talking about the ecological and all that, they, it's all through the same thing where they can't just, it's not a free-for-all for them. Uh, no, um, I can look into that question more. Um, I think recently there probably MRC had a couple properties along Soil Canyon Road. Uh, we can look into that. Uh, it just seems like they get their permits a little easier and their fits. The film on their property seems to be a little easier than for the average person. And I just wonder if they go through the same process. Yeah, I think um, they, they have their own property. So it's an interesting conversation because one of the things our council is trying to figure out is the level of authority on the MRCA and us. Because in some cases, it's not clear. Right. We, we have one we opinion and the state has a different opinion. Um, but yes, there's the, the permit process is the same. What ends up happening is they will able to do the permit for that particular pop, you know, property. But if there's a piece of that property it's on MSRC, you know, MSRA, or whatever. Uh, right, thank you. Um, that gets coordinated, and they have to make sure, the coordinators have to make sure that's been done, and that's added to the whole packet. But I think there's a question for us around levels of authority and approval, and where does the county end versus the state? Um, and in some cases, it's very unclear, and we would like to be in more control. Yes, sir, last question on this stuff. Uh, well, not on that topic, on the previous one. Uh, I'm curious, when we have a room full of location professionals, I would be curious if we could ask, if we could see if there's a consensus on their opinion, if they feel a local Acton permitting office would help, would improve the communications uh, challenge that it seems to exist here between permitting and the citizen. Sure. I mean, if you want to show, show of hands, but there's a whole process to establishing that. Um, Obviously, I don't think anyone up here could commit to that at this point in time. But well, not we'll go, if you want to try to show that consensus, please feel free if you think. If you're a location professional and you agree, based on your professional experiences, that Acton should look into a permit, its own permitting office, so we have the resources local here and less of a communication burden, if that would better the situation as far as the complaints from the citizenry. It's unincorporated county, so it, it's not a municipality. There's no, there's no governmental, uh, there's no governmental way to do it with an act. About the town council, town council, it's not, it doesn't have, it doesn't have jurisdictional responsibility. There are no laws with the town council. 
whereas they are with the county. We go to the entity that enforces code. So in, until ACTA, it happened in Santa Clarita. City of Santa Clarita used to be one through Film LA. Then they incorporated into their own city. But the Saugus, the candy country, you went through the county permit. Now it's its own city. They have their own permit process. This, there's no code here for acting. So you have to go through something that enforces the code for acting. The gentleman's correct. It, um, the acting town council doesn't have the authority to be that type of regulatory body. Um, that does flow through the county of LA. And right now, our partners from LA. So that still is a mechanism, and you know, unless something different were to so happen. So if there were a satellite office locally enacted from Phil LA, would that, that, that would be something better? more feasible to have a discussion about? Although, you know, again, but I defer to the experts on permitting to what that might look like, but today it might be a little premature with 10 minutes left to have that. But it, it's definitely worth talking about, and I have my cards up here if you want to come grab one, and we can all connect in and have a side conversation. That okay. Um, Jackie has uh, more questions here. The AV area plan vision is intent, quote, intended to create opportunities for the Animal Valley to change and grow while preserving the rural lifestyle enjoyed by Hills Clover. This is our land use policy, page two. First land use goal articulate, articulated in the AV area plan stipulates that all land use patterns must maintain and enhance rural character. Furthermore, the AV plan states that when adapting to new issues and opportunities, the county must ensure the land uses do not compromise rural character. Uh, policy LU 6.2, and when reviewing changing conditions, the county must ensure that land uses are compatible with the area plan's rural preservation strategy. Uh, question one, does the county executive office consider explosions, fireballs, mortar rounds, hovering helicopters, automatic gunfire, and unshielded lights to be land uses that are compatible with Acton's rural character? If yes, how are these land uses compatible with Acton's rural ca character? And if no, why does the county approve permits for such activities? That's question one. <coughs> I mean, that's a, that's a very long question, and I'm happy to communicate with you about that. This is not the forum to get into that level of detail. I'm not prepared to answer that. So if you want to email me directly, I'm happy to respond. And again, Jackie, if you want to we can see. Question two, what measures did CEO consider and implement to preserve active rural character on recent film permits that authorized explosions and you know, aforementioned incidents? Um, three, does the county understand the aviary plan elevates the preservation of active rural character above other land use considerations? Um, and four, does CEO understand that the aviary plan does not permit the county to subordinate active rural character to economic interests of the film industry? So again, as Gary indicated, um, always happy to engage in that conversation and we'll make sure these questions get to him so that conversation can be had. Um, we have a few minutes left here. Chuck, what are we looking at here? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, let's see. Next question. Why aren't people who make false complaints forced to pay the county for the cost of shares or fire? Can it be done? Again, why are people who make false complaints forced to pay the county for the cost of shares of fire? Can it be done? Uh, people are making complaints about filming on a property they're doing illegal, and then they get there and they're, there's no, they're in code. They're, they're, they're just har harassing the, the, the property owner or where they're filming, Oscar, which happens a lot out here. Oscar, do we have uh, mechanisms for false complaints? Because obviously if there's a you know, a verifiable complaint, you know, they could be issued a notice of violation and you start going through a formal process. Or whereby, if not compliance, you can go all the way up to the district attorney, misdemeanor, so on and so forth. But for false complaints, is there a process in place? Or? No, uh, my department, the Department of Urgent Planning, we respond to complaints. We receive the complaints and we go out to visit the property. And we find that the property is in compliance. Uh, we don't take any additional steps. Let the owner know that there are compliance, there are no issues, and we're going to move forward. Uh, obviously, we do find zoning violations, um, and we're going to have to send that notice of violation and then move forward. Our goal is always voluntary compliance, but if there's no voluntary compliance, as Chris said, you know, we have to take additional enforcement steps. But some neighbors, some people will complain just to get harassed. 
And the question was, can something be done about them when they're proved false? I had one neighbor one time that said, if you give me $5,000 every show, I'll shut up. <laughs> but we don't, because the shows we do don't gather that money. So she would continue to complain and call up Film LA, or call zoning, or call the police, or call fire saying, trucks are all over my property. Her house is 300 yards from the road, which is all fenced in. It's impossible to do that. And they would come out and they would look and they go, nothing can happen here. So why can't something be done about people like that? The police are coming out, the fire department comes out to inspect, and they go, there's nothing wrong. Why can't those people continue to do that? So obviously we're going to address any complaints that we get responded out to and everything. Exactly. If the pattern does evolve, there is a, there is a process with the Sheriff's Department that eventually you become like a nuisance complainer, and that has to go through the captain and he goes downtown, and that person becomes a nuisance complainer, we don't respond to them anymore. But it is lengthy, and it, it, it does require quite a bit, and there is a few that I know that we don't respond to their houses anymore unless it's like, Hey, I'm having a heart attack, but because they complain so much, it's, it's frustrating. And I feel you on that. Because I, I hate one of those houses where, hey, I've been in your house, you know, 20 times now, and I know that nothing's going on, but i got to come out here. But there is a process with at least us, I don't know with them, but with the sheriff's part where we, you know, eventually stop responding. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, I propose a five mile per hour speed limit for all private dirt roads and act in the rule safe for, 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 for filming traffic, including setup and tear down days. According to CHP, there is no speed limit on private roads. When I've called CHP or Sheriff, they tell me they can't enforce speeding problems on private roads since there is no speed limit and they are private roads. Speeding is a huge problem on the dirt roads due to livestock, dust, and noise. And I don't know if there's one. Hi, how are you? Okay. So I am a horse trainer and I have uh, my own ranch in Hogwood Old Safe and I train horses full time, that's how I make my living. And I also go around to private ranches in Acton and train people's horses and teach riding lessons at my place and at private homes in Acton and Hogwood Old Safe. And this is a huge, huge problem because I've called numerous times uh, CHP and Sheriff's Office over the years to complain about film traffic speeding on my road and every single time they come out they say I'm sorry you know we'd love to help you but we can't because there's no speed limit for a private road and this is a dirt road with some washboard it's super loud super dusty and super dangerous it goes down to one lane in places on the road so if two people are going 40 miles an hour you can see what could happen and there's also people ride horses and walk and so forth and I would like to see something that's enforceable by law enforcement. So if I call, I can get some help. Public works. Public works and CHP. Okay. Yeah, I understand the, 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 the issues. Uh, but then again, on public roads, there are really no established speed limits because simply because private roads. Private, 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 private. <laughs> on private roads, there are no speed limits because the speed limits that you want to establish are actually with the property. So whatever happens on the property owners, uh, if there's film activity, that's something that needs to be worked out with the production company. So that if you want to impose your, uh, you know, a five mile per hour speed limit or ten mile per hour speed limit, because whether it's dust, whether the, if the condition of the road is such that it's dangerous, where a vehicle can flip over, if you have concerns about adjacent uh, structures near the road, you know, those are things that uh, need to be accommodated and you need to make sure that as a private property owner that you work it out with the production company. So I, I don't think that the sheriff or any other uh, uh, enforcement agency can actually enforce speed limits uh, on private roads. But you, Public Works, are the ones issuing the permit that allows that, exactly. that circumstance to exist. So it's because you're issuing film permits, right? For your issue film permits for filming operations that go on her road. Well, okay. Right. Let me just yeah. clarify this. Oh, so hold on one second. Hold on. I know we're coming towards the end. Everyone's getting okay. excited again. But let's, 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 hold on one second. Okay. One second. Do you want to respond to Sam? 
Uh, or, yeah, I just want to clarify to the members of the audience that Public Works, we approve the, the film permit before it's released. However, our responsibility is really ministerial at this point. We just want to make sure that the, the, the county departments who are responsible in reviewing uh, uh, film conditions that under their purview are being done. We don't really go into the particulars, especially when it affects private property. So which department, if yours is a ministerial review, which department should this lady go to to ask that when you issue a permit that's going to use a film permit that's going to rely on her road to access the spot or use her road or whatever, that they impose conditions that address those circumstances? I'll take that. Okay, right. So just relative to the road, so we have a special condition enacted which came as a result of our conversations with the town council, film committee. At 10 miles an hour at this point on private roads. Sam's right. Okay, he's not have legal jurisdiction over private roads. That's private property on a right issue. However, because of these concerns, we went down to, it was actually higher, we, rose, we lowered it down to 10 miles an hour. It's not solving your answer of the immediate issue of when you witness a, well, in this case, you mentioned you said you see film crews do it. Obviously, we want to make sure that's actually a film crew doing that. Well, let's just say oh, it's, it is. It's, yeah, it's, let's, it's let's a caravan and big rigs yeah. and huge Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's an important event. That is to be revisited. You know, we're all. Well, the, the dirt roads are also fall. supposed to be watered, yeah. and they never, ever are. Yeah, ever. so I just want to mention to you because you started. actually were one of the catalysts for when we worked in Agma Belse to try to do it. Their conditions were, were pulled, which included language to protect you. Uh, because they hadn't gone through a public process. So we hope they do, because that language was in the Aguadalce conditions that were rewritten because of people like you who helped us understand better. So we sympathize with that. Uh, but you, also, the other thing about the permit is it's an, really an exemption to zoning. And when the permit has all kinds of language attached to it standardly, including that they have to follow and obey all laws, private roads create a really unique situation because that's a private concern and a private situation which we tried to address and the county agreed to address by making these kinds of conditions that 10 miles an hour, dust minimization is required, notifying horse properties when you're going to go by, and they can't drive the big trucks on those roads. Uh, that was all part because of your statement and others who own horses when we did that. So we're hoping you guys come back and we can help with that. So Paul and Gary? Something needs to be said to that production company that's yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's every single one of them. We have to know that movie people, no matter how many they have on the crew, there's always an idiot. There's always somebody that's going to cause a problem. And you have to be on top of it. I have a, I have a quick question. As I always say, that, as I, people have told me many times, they said, excuse the language, but they'll always say, shit happens. And my response to that is, yeah. And it's always caused by an asshole. <laughs> I've got a quick question. Yes. Okay. Gary, can you close the one second? I know we're about to wrap here. Sure. We're wrapping up. Hold on one second. Uh, Pertain pertaining to that Chris, last question, it's a real last comment. comment. It's really quick, right, right, just for Paul and Gary. And, it, and I don't know the answer to this, but if um, sheriffs and highway patrol have no control over private roads, we, we verified that. But if it's a condition in our film standards, and someone is violating that, does that now give them authorization to slow people down on the road? You can't create law enforcement powers. So, so, let me, let me so, so there's still not enforceable conditions. Well, let me, let me, let me, I can't give my straight answer. I'm not going to give you an answer. Let me address it. So a private road might as well be your living room. Okay? I cannot come in and enforce traffic laws in your living room. Okay? Just because it's a road, I can't do it. It's private. What this, this, this issue is between the landowners and the permit holders, the production companies. So you have a problem and they go, they're speeding up and down my road, you let the law enforcement know, CHP or sheriffs, and go, we can go to the production location and go, hey, look, can you get your guys to slow down? All right, look, there's a cause of dust and all this. Yeah, yeah, we're sorry, we'll do that. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I can't write them a ticket for it. At worst, if it becomes a safety issue, yeah, okay, maybe we can revoke the permit, but you guys are shut down because you're not behaving. But I can't write a ticket. There's no laws that apply to that. We'll be there to try and you know mend the fences and smooth the waters, but but it is a permit condition, so some action should take happen. Well, here's the going, here's the 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 down, down, but that's not an action. That's just a request. Exactly, so, because because they're not breaking any law. 